Hawaii Union of Socialists in Modern Times Articles Concerning Hawaiian Nationalism As read by Schitt's Leopold Modern Times Why Modern Times? Remember the great Charlie Chaplin film Modern Times which ridiculed factory speed-ups and discipline and capitalist law and order. Forty years later, capitalism is even more absurd and oppressive. We face new and mounting problems for which many of the ready answers of the past are relevant. Modern Times, this periodic bulletin of analysis, proposals, and opinions is an attempt to get us to confront our problems squarely and to seek out solutions. Our viewpoint is socialist and our method is scientific. By scientific, we do not mean using incomprehensible phrases or trying to justify positions by religiously quoting old Marxist works. Scientific method means collecting necessary information, summing up experience, and evaluating old and new theories in the light of additional information. This method is self-correcting since the process of testing theories against reality, that is, through practice, leads to deeper understanding and more effective strategies. Low theoretical level. To put it bluntly, the theoretical level of the socialist movement in the U.S. is low, and this is particularly true in Hawaii, where there has been little theoretical discussion or struggle for unity. As more people involve themselves in political struggle and look for real causes and solutions, much more will be expected and needed from socialists. From sharing experiences and viewpoints, socialists can gain and learn from their own and others' experience, and our practice and theory will improve, and our unity grow. In modern times we plan to summarize the contending views held by different socialist writers and leaders on key issues. Investigate problems that are especially important to us in Hawaii, and review some basic socialist writings to see how they can help us today. We will also spotlight key international and national issues as they affect the positions and work of the socialist movement in the U.S. Use this bulletin. We want this bulletin to be used for dialogue and discussion, and hope it can be used in study groups and to launch forums on key issues and problems. We will actively seek out different views on the vital questions facing us. But we will insist in investigation in a simple, easy-to-read mass style which avoids empty sloganeering and rhetoric divorced from fact. We hope that modern times will be a useful tool for the socialist movement locally and will help bridge the distance between work experience in various communities and work sites and on the neighbor islands. Please share it with your friends and co-workers. Give us your ideas, criticisms, and articles. For the bulletin to be successful, your feedback and contributions are vital. Walking night marchers, sacred and regenerated. Lost ways of thinking, whole culture's been incinerated. Defined Hawaiian Nation. Some Thoughts, Part 1, by S. Wallis. As read by Schitt's Leopold. The question has been raised, can Hawaii be considered a nation, and what attitude should revolutionaries take toward the Ohana and other nationalist organizations in Hawaii? In the first place, Hawaiian nationalism springs primarily from the existence of capitalist social relations through the development of U.S. colonialism and the oppression of nationalities and working people locally by the ruling class. Capitalism divides exploited classes of people along racial and sexual lines today as it did during the early plantation days in Hawaii. Capitalism perverts cultural traditions and makes a mockery of Hawaiian history, packaging it like candeloa for tourists and profits. Capitalism alienates land from the users, makes it a commodity on the market, and destroys the heritage of Hawaii as it alters the landscape and attacks the cultural roots of the people. The feelings of nationalism felt by many Hawaiians and others of Hawaii's peoples are natural reactions to this oppression. Yet, knowing this, what is the role of nationalism in Hawaii? Right to self-determination. Revolutionary Marxism has held that nationalism, in the sense of setting apart the interests of your own nation against those of another, in the era of imperialism is no longer unqualifiedly progressive, but that each oppressed nation, nonetheless, has the right to self-determination, up to and including the right to politically secede from an oppressor nation. Given this, socialists support nationalist movements in their struggles against imperialist domination, and at the same time, argue that nationalism itself stands in the way of overall political development of the working class internationally. Generally speaking, the task of complete national self-determination can only be solved on the basis of economically united peoples, purged of bourgeois rule. However, the relationship between the national aspirations of an oppressed people and the working class movement has not been easily resolved. In particular cases such as Hawaii where the nationalities are intimately intermingled, 
not separated into clear geographical concentrations, present difficult problems. We cannot depend on old masters for the solution. We must taste the prickly pear in order to know it. We must struggle with the reality of Hawaiian nationalism. Perhaps a useful way to assist in examining the national question in Hawaii would be to set forth some of the possible positions revolutionaries could take on the question of Hawaiian nationalism. In doing so, it is essential that this be carried out within the context of building a revolutionary program which aims to unite workers of all nationalities and sexes in Hawaii. We must also remember that the key question for non-Hawaiian socialists is to attack our own ruling class even if we disagree with the ideology of Hawaiian nationalism. Possible Positions on Hawaiian Nationalism 1. Diversion The national struggle is a diversion from the class struggle and is essentially petty bourgeois. Hawaii is integrated into the U.S. The Hawaiian nation no longer exists, or perhaps never existed, and is unlikely to exist in the future. Hawaiians are now simply an oppressed minority like Samoans, blacks, etc. The role of socialists must be to oppose the national movement in contrast to it a revolutionary perspective for all of Hawaii's working class people. 2. Reparations The U.S. illegally deprived Hawaiians of their nationhood, 1893, and thus Hawaiians should receive monetary compensation. This could be in the form of cash payments or in an extension of various welfare and community services or organizations. 3. Land The chief aspect of U.S. Imperialism in Hawaii was the illegal seizure of lands. Therefore, federal lands should be returned to the Hawaiian people, either on an individual basis or to a revived Hawaiian Homes Commission or into parks and sanctuaries. 4. Self-determination. The Hawaiian people, as an ethnic group, are a nation and thus have the right to self-determination. Hawaii is no longer a separate national political entity oppressed by the U.S., but Hawaiians still have and feel a national oppression from the history and workings of imperialist expansion in the Pacific. The exact implications of this position can only be seen in the unfolding of the struggle, but it implies a loss of control by the U.S. over a portion of its subjects. As a positive goal, short-term demands could involve Hawaiian language and cultural issues, affirmative action, etc. Ultimately, the demand might be extended to cover actual separation of a part of Hawaii from the United States under the control of a Hawaiian government or some forms of local autonomy. 5. Secession Hawaii should secede from the U.S. as the best means of ending two centuries of colonial oppression against Hawaii and its immigrant people. Hawaii is essentially a third world country and will have to break politically from the U.S. before its economy can be built up and standard of living improve. These probably cover the major ground of the various possible positions, but where should we begin in investigating them? First, a precise appraisal of the specific historical situation and, primarily, of economic conditions must be made. The U.S. economy, while partially recovered from the recession of 1974-75, to is unlikely to regain the high growth patterns found after World War II. This implies a depressive effect for Hawaii's economy, which is increasingly tied to the U.S., business cycle by the fragile tourism industry. As a result, corporations and politicians will be trying to co-opt any resistance and force the workers to bear the cost of capitalist crisis. Lower wages, higher taxes, fewer public services, greater environmental destruction, U.S. Nationality tie jingoism. The business is life. Campaign by the Hawaii Business Council is an indication of the propaganda that can be expected in the future as well as the employer's use of con-con against the public, workers' right to strike and continued attacks on unemployment and welfare benefits. Second, the distortion of Hawaii's economy through the colonial and neo-colonial development of sugar, pineapple, defense, and tourism means that Hawaii's working class is particularly atomized and isolated. The unions have lost much of their strength with plantation agriculture and the inability to organize effectively in the tourist industry. The traditional ties of labor to the Democrats are disarming the labor movement politically. Third, the political backwardness of the working class movement in the U.S. and the isolation of Hawaii from other Pacific areas suggests that Hawaii socialists cannot wait for the growth of an international revolutionary movement to have an impact in Hawaii. Eventually, Hawaii socialists must link up with those on the mainland, and probably in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific area. But in the meantime, we must rapidly and consistently develop a revolutionary program with immediate impact in Hawaii.
the problems of slower economic growth in hawaii are going to present some real dangers to the workers movement here finally as a result of these problems and the specific manner in which tourism in the u s military presence attack hawaiian culture we can expect the hawaiian struggle to remain in the forefront until a more generalized working class response and political movement begins this is not a call for socialists to put all their eggs in the ohana basket but to realize that many of the best militants in hawaii will be involved in these struggles as they have been in the past besides supporting the hawaiian struggle for its own sake socialists should also recognize that routes to the working class appear in many places and the national struggle may be a key one in hawaii also key to unity with these struggles is the understanding that their victories weaken our common foes the military and the corporations it protects positions on the hawaiian national question part two by s wallies as read by schitt's leopold a diversion this position involves one of the most difficult contradictions on the one hand it recognizes the objective reality that nationalism as opposed to demanding the right to self-determination in hawaii is primarily petty bourgeois and that the real solution to the oppression of hawaiians can only finally be brought about through socialist revolution it also recognizes the fact of the effective integration of hawaii into the u s on the other hand by denying the specific oppression of hawaiians which has developed historically this position amounts to confirming the ruling class notion of a pluralistic and homogeneous state a melting pot society with no substantial national or ethnic grievances or injustices what is the nature of the hawaiian nation it is relatively clear that from eighteen ninety three to the nineteen thirties hawaii was essentially a colonial possession of the u s political independence was already becoming tenuous by the time of the great mahale in eighteen forty eight from the beginnings of the sugar industry hawaiian society became more and more dominated by capitalist formations tied to u s monopoly capitalism in an almost classic marxist determination however it is relatively clear as well that up to the preparations for world war ii socialists would have supported attempts for national self-determination for hawaii with the rise of world war ii both u s and local bourgeois interests found commercial and political reasons for hawaii to be integrated into the u s and this occurred fairly rapidly by nineteen forty the population was already twenty six per cent haole foreign usually meaning caucasian second only to the japanese workers hawaii as a nation had dissolved however just as the native americans have been demanding a measure of self-determination on the mainland the intermingling of peoples in hawaii has not overcome the cultural and socio-economic oppression of hawaiians in their own land when one considers that hawaii has been a state for only eighteen years and effectively under integration by the u s only for forty or fifty years and when one recognizes the pockets of hawaiian culture which exist uneasily with capitalism in rural areas then the special interests of hawaiians are better seen the crux of the national question may come down to these questions how deeply do the hawaiians feel their oppression how oppressed are they materially and would the vast majority of hawaiians actively support a progressive national movement socialists arguing that the national movement is a diversion must have strong answers to these questions reparations the basis of the reparations argument is really that of recognizing u s control of hawaii today denying the existence of national status for hawaiians opting instead for special status within the confines of the u s it would seem that this position is the least tenable for socialists since it seeks to create special advantages based on heritage rather than citing current oppression apparently this position represents liberal or paternalistic interests trying to get a bigger piece of the pie for themselves socialists have few interests in compensating former big landowners for losses which another part of the capitalist class has appropriated land this position seems to be an improvement over the financial reparations position since it imposes no special levy against other sectors of hawaii and u s people through additional taxation it is however a very unclear position at present which land is to be repossessed who is going to get it etc in many cases the land position amounts to setting up various hawaiians in the same special status of reparations winners with no acknowledgment of ongoing oppression the question of turning the land over to parks sanctuaries and other public areas is admirable 
but hardly a key component of the national struggle. Self-determination. The ultimate conclusion of this position, separation of the Hawaiian Islands into Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian political formations, seems to some so extraordinary that the position cannot be feasible. However, there are many problems which cannot be solved under capitalism, such as full employment, and yet remain important and effective demands. The position recognizes the specific oppression of Hawaiians in the context of the territory's integration into the U.S. It helps replace U.S. national chauvinism with anti-imperialism, and can also be the basis for generating a higher socialist consciousness in Hawaii. Many of the demands in the process of self-determination and rejection of the legitimacy of the existing government situation concerning Hawaiians will be difficult to work out. Others will pose sharp problems for the state and the U.S., such as attempts to put land areas such as Kaho'olawe under Hawaiian control. If the position moved toward its ultimate conclusion, one would expect that a widespread social movement would have already erupted in Hawaii. Secession. Although socialists support the right to self-determination, they also realize the actual implementation of that demand may not be in the interests of the working class movement in the oppressed nation. In fact, the secession question is most closely related to the chauvinist and backward immigration limitations proposed by Ariyoshi. Footnote. Koji Ariyoshi, born on a coffee plantation in Kona, he was a student. A stevedore, a World War II attorney military language specialist, writer, editor, and political activist who dedicated his life to the advancement of working men and women and their right to organize. Because he was in the mainland at the outbreak of World War II, he was interned at Manzanar relocation camp, where he enlisted in the army and was assigned to Yen in China as an interpreter and U.S. military observer. Back in Hawaii after the war, he established and edited his own pro-labor newspaper, the Honolulu Record, and helped to write for an edit Tai Manjuna with Reverend Emilio Yadao. In 1951, with John and I. Ko Rieneke, Jack Hall of the ILWU, and others he was arrested under the Smith Act for being a communist. Though he was regarded by all as a quiet and unassuming man, the pages of the Honolulu record over the ten years he was able to keep it going, not only chronicled the growth of Hawaii's labor movement which was being ignored by the major papers, but revealed the eloquence and passion of his contempt for injustice and social inequities in Hawaii. The U.S. and Asia. Footnote end of secession fosters the illusion of self-sufficiency and progressive elements of the local bourgeoisie. In this climate, secession should not be supported by revolutionaries, although it might be in a radically changed social and political situation in the future. Summing up, we would justify the right of self-determination for Hawaiians on the basis of historic and current oppression. Main of the questions included in this process pose difficult questions for the monopoly capitalists and can be used to attack their rule. At the same time, we must realize that the major present dangers for Hawaii socialists are Hawaii localism, implied by the secession argument, and insensitivity to the Hawaiian struggle. Socialists must analyze this question more completely, integrate the existence of the national movement into an overall revolutionary program striking at bourgeois rule, and attempt to link up with revolutionaries internationally. In fact, without this theory, program and practice, the chances for degeneration of the national struggle, such that it becomes a hurdle for socialists, become greater month by month. Paradise and peril, so tropical, so beautiful. Warm people, sunshine, and pure bloodlines. It's not our subline, we got drugs in the one time. Meth labs and slum grinds. Tasks for revolutionaries in Hawaii. A contribution to the Hawaii Union of Socialists HUS Political Directions discussion. By S. Wallis, as read by Schitt's Leopold. The Coalition of Hawaii Public Sector Unions Combating the State's Intransigent Opposition to Cost of Living Adjustments to Workers' Incomes marks an important step forward in the recent history of the labor movement in Hawaii. However, socialists will be hard-pressed to advance this struggle beyond reformist trade unionism unless we develop an overall analysis of capitalism's situation in Hawaii today. Hawaii has a long history of labor militancy, including in particular the initial organizing of the plantation workforce into the ILWU with the assistance of the Communist Party and allied militants. But these historic struggles have been successfully channeled into reformist directions over the last 20 years, with the virtual integration of the unions with the Democratic Party. Struggles which now exist, such as Kalama Valley in the early 1970s, or Chinatown today, are scattered across the political landscape with little unified and coherent interrelationship with long-term goals for social justice through socialist revolution. 
Although workers and oppressed nationalities in Hawaii remain combative, the left has not been able to provide coherent leadership to these struggles in terms of challenging the power of capitalism in Hawaii. A capitalism which is daily changing under the pressure of international corporate adventures. Hawaii is witnessing the demise of its agricultural proletariat and its replacement with a much more dispersed and atomized service sector working class based on the tourism industry. In many ways Hawaii is becoming recolonized with new political contradictions arising between the local bourgeoisie, Palaka power, for example, and the agents of the multinational corporations which increasingly control Hawaii's destiny. Hawaii's unions are increasingly tied by their bureaucratic leaders to the success of the capitalist system and the struggles for Hawaiian rights. Women's liberation, low-cost housing, and environmental protection are contrasted to the need for jobs and incomes. Hawaii is increasingly tied to business conditions on the mainland and Japan, so that the general economic stagnation which has affected the capitalist world since 1968 will make this tourism-based economy even more fragile. Yet the social needs brought about by the shifting structure of Hawaii's economy and the fundamental weakness of tourism as a viable economic institution raise the serious question in the minds of people throughout Hawaii. Where lies the future? Or, what the fuck, they go and broke this island. The weight of that pressure can be seen by the appeal of the Kaho'o Lave Ohana, Hale Mohalu, and nowhere more than by the pressure of the public workers' rank and file for a cost of living allowance in the current negotiations. The failure of the governor and the legislature, including the absurd posturings of Cayetano, to respond in even a minimal way to these demands severely hinders the sellout hopes of the Trasks and Epsteins, but also makes it necessary for revolutionaries to provide a coherent political alternative to liberal capitalism. Failure to do so will mean a temporary solution to the capitalists' needs to reorient and depoliticize Hawaii's working class, reducing social services and slashing real incomes. HUS, and the socialist movement in general, needs to develop an action program to link today's many struggles to the needs of the future, to develop forms of mass organization with union members which will show the way for real workers' democracy, and to strive to break Hawaii's political isolation from outside political movements. The May Day program, although generally successful, mobilized few workers and showed how weak our present ties are with workers. The dangers of a 15% decline in incomes through inflation over the next two years, followed by the specter of high unemployment with recession in 1980, possible restrictions on gasoline fuel purchases, and continued state fiscal austerity, including the imminent layoff of over 1,400 CETA workers this fall, make revolutionary socialist tasks seem incredible. Yet we have the experience of several years of struggle and the creativity of the masses at our fingertips if we are committed enough to make that step. A central political initiative and program posing the elementary needs of the working class in Hawaii and including and uniting the existing social struggles could provide a powerful socialist alternative to challenge the monopoly of political representation now held by the bourgeoisie. This is, indeed, the only way forward for the working people of Hawaii. Sometimes you catch a glimpse of the once was Hawaii's 78, the dead are crying. We must pay homage, but nobody's trying. Cause the land is raped, some try to escape, and the culture is scraped of its identity. The beach front is a gate, put condos in its place. Hotels and hookers, this heaven's a disgrace. We used to farm and fish, now we stand and wait. The food stamps, welfare, and Section 8. Thoughts on the Hawaii National Question by Ivan Ho, as read by Schitt's Leopold. A national question arises when the people of a given territory are systematically oppressed as a people beyond that which can be explained by the normal exploitation that goes on under capitalism. In the U.S., national questions have arisen concerning black, Chicano, Indian, and Puerto Rican peoples. In Spain there exists a Basque national question in Iran, a Kurdish national question in Ethiopia, an Eritrean national question, and in Canada, a Quebec national question. In essence, the Hawaii national question is this, is Hawaii a permanent part of the United States like Ohio or Pennsylvania, in spite of its having been forcibly annexed, its geographical location, and its history of Polynesian and Oriental peoples? It will not do simply to say yes or no based on our own subjective wishes or thinking. We must have a real study of the question. The answer, once researched, will give us clarity in defining our political tasks. For years now, the socialist movement in Hawaii has been characterized by jumping into support for this or that community eviction struggle or strike with no overall guiding line as to where it all leads, except vaguely eventually to socialism. But as Chairman Mao has so succinctly put it, when a task, no matter which, 
has to be performed, but there is as yet no guiding line, method, plan or policy. The principal and decisive thing is to decide on a guiding line, method, plan or policy. From on contradiction, whenever the need to deepen our theoretical work is raised, someone will inevitably call out, yes, but we don't want theory divorced from practice. In the general sense this is true, but in the context where practice divorced from theory is the rule, this amounts to a cover-up of the predominant economism and spontaneity. What is necessary at this point is to make an all-sided investigation of the political economy of Hawaii, past and present, and to examine the attitudes regarding Hawaii's status as the 50th state which exists among the various classes and nationalities of Hawaii. Certainly among Hawaiians that status is being questioned, others are somewhat open about it, but are non-committal. Being integrated into the USA has brought a measure of prosperity to some. It cannot be doubted. On the other hand, others are alienated from the U.S. and everything it stands for. At present, Hawaii is very dependent on the U.S. mainland, but does it have to be that way? Attacks on tourists and military personnel are a symptom of the resentment and frustration of the dispossessed. With the military occupying 25% of Oahu's land as well as Pearl Harbor, and with resort developments, condominiums, and golf courses sprouting up like weeds, many people are saying enough already. But since capitalism pushes relentlessly into every nook and cranny regardless of the desires of existing residents, the problem will get continually worse until forced to do otherwise. This pressure then generates an interest on the part of oppressed people to resist. This process is the dialectics of historical relations between the oppressor and the oppressed. As is well known, Hawaii has a significance for military strategy beyond the mere economic investment in the form of industry and tourism here. Hawaii is the command center for the military capacity of U.S. imperialism in the Pacific and Asia. As such, it will go to extreme lengths to avoid giving it up. On the other hand, the very presence of such military concentration makes Oahu an inevitable target in a nuclear war as long as that concentration exists. This is the key point. This is why the Hawaii national question has international significance. If Hawaii's people, under the leadership of the working class, unify against the further intrusion of U.S. imperialism and force it to retreat, and in the process defeat the local collaborators, then Hawaii will be in a far better position to survive a world war. Such actions would also make a significant contribution toward reducing the danger of a U.S.-provoked world war by destabilizing a key base area. So far in the discussion of the issue, two distinct positions have emerged. The RCP, continuing the traditions of the CPUSA, regards Hawaii as an inseparable part of the USA. According to their program, the Workers' Viewpoint Organization declares that Hawaii is a colony and urges independence as long as imperialism has not been overthrown on the U.S. mainland. However, many questions remain to be answered, and any solution must involve the organized strength of the working class and its allies. So far, this is not an issue that has gripped the masses, but it is likely to do so before long. The national question is not fundamentally a question of race, but of class. Formal political independence for a nation without soon attaining economic independence leads to a continued all-around dependency on the oppressor nation for jobs, industrial goods, and even for food itself. A radical break has to be made with the economic order that binds the oppressed nation to the oppressor. This requires a socialist revolution and a smashing of the control of the existing capitalist class and its structures that perpetuate that control. Economic independence does not mean, of course, cessation of trade relations with other countries, but cessation of unequal trade. Such a transformation cannot come about without the working class at its head, together with a Marxist-Leninist party to guide it. Even then, the danger of revisionism lurks in the shadows, as we have seen in the USSR and China, but the struggle is doomed to failure without ML leadership. For such leadership to arise, the working class must come to understand the political economy of Hawaii both its internal workings right here, and how it connects with the mainland. But this knowledge does not come spontaneously through day-to-day -day shop struggles or even in major strikes. As Lenin pointed out 75 years ago, this knowledge must be brought to the working class by that portion of the intelligentsia which takes the class stand of the workers and seeks to merge with them in forming a class-conscious proletarian revolution. In turn, this group, which has the training to do this work, must do it not tail after each spontaneous movement that arises from the oppression of capitalism. Failure to engage in this work and to unite with the deepest sentiments of the people for liberation can lead to race war by default. As people explode with anger at the nearest vulnerable target, such as isolated GIs or tourists now, and perhaps attack larger groups of people later, 
Regardless of the solution to the Hawaii national question, whether as part of the U.S. working class struggle or as a striving for independence, the enemy is U.S. imperialism, which is responsible for both the exploitation of the working class and the oppression of non-white nationalities here on the mainland and around the world. To make the details of this exploitation and oppression concretely visible as a system is the task of revolutionary intellectuals. Failure to do this educational work amounts to betrayal, even more than of so-called labor leaders who settle for contracts favorable to management by selling out workers' demands. When the dominant worldwide mode of production is capitalist, it is unlikely that unequal trade relations can be ended by a revolution. Even with trade among self-proclaimed socialist nations, the nature of the trade is still commodity production for exchange. As Kim Il-sung has written, while a revolution may help to decrease the inequality of trade relations, the disadvantages of a non-industrial country that must trade with technologically advanced countries will remain for a long time. Concerning the question of a conscious vanguard party, several successful revolutionary movements have claimed that they were not led by a Marxist-Leninist party, although the leadership was influenced by ML ideas. These countries include Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. ML parties were officially formed after victory, in the case of Cuba. The old Communist Party was taken over by the new revolutionary leadership. I can only hope that we can wake up and take it back to the purity of the ancient times when the money was obscurity. When the money was obscurity. The National Question in Hawaii. Nationalism, a non-question. By John Rianecki, as read by Schitt's Leopold. Footnote. Rianecki was born in southeastern Kansas. He moved to Hawaii in 1926 became a professor at the University of Hawaii in Creole languages, and wasted no time in becoming one of the island's leading dissenters against the control of Hawaiian society by the plantocracy and the military that existed for much of this century. He formed lifelong friendships with both Jack Hall of the ILWU and Art Ruddledge of the Hotel Workers Union, who used to say, John made the snowballs, and I threw them. Assisting the unions cost him and his wife their jobs during the red baiting of the 1950s as he was branded a communist and persecuted relentlessly as one of the Hawaii Seven. He, nevertheless, stood courageously by his principles and wrote so extensively about the early years of the labor movement in Hawaii that he can truly be considered the father of Hawaii's labor history. Many of the changes in Hawaiian social and labor organization for which he worked in the 1930s and 1940s became reality though at the time they seemed an impossible dream. Footnote end. It is my position that time and energy devoted to the Hawaiian national question is mostly time and energy wasted, which could be devoted to much more important issues. In this limited space, I shall disregard all definitions of nationality, since, no matter how many or how few criteria of nationality fit a population, the crucial question is whether or not it looks upon itself as a nation and behaves accordingly. We should also bear in mind that nationhood does not necessarily entail demand for political sovereignty. The Scots are a good example of this. I will point out, however, that the term Hawaiian nationalism confuses two related but different things. A sense of nationhood including island residents of all ancestries and a sense of nationhood among those residents who have some aboriginal ancestry. I shall refer to these as island nationalism and native nationalism respectively. Hawaiians and part Hawaiians is classified by the census amount to about one-fifth of our population. It follows that without backing from island nationalism, native nationalism is not likely to get very far. Yet obviously outside a small minority of native or part native Hawaiians, a sense of island nationalism is almost non-existent. What might give rise and support to a sense of island nationality? First, a feeling that Hawaiian island traditions, culture, and social ties are distinctly different from and perhaps in opposition to those of the mainland USA. Second, a sense of being politically deprived, relegated to an inferior grade of citizenship. Third, a sense of having been and still being economically exploited. Some left-wingers appear to rely chiefly upon the last as a plausible basis for advocating a Hawaiian island separatism or even sovereignty. But what are the facts? Progressively during this century, and especially since the Second World War, Hawaii has become more closely tied to the mainland, culturally and demographically. With the coming of air travel, there is great two-way traffic between Hawaii and the mainland. We are acutely aware of the recent influx of mainlanders, but this is largely matched by emigration to the mainland, for both temporary and permanent residents. Consequently, there are increasingly strong ties of kinship, often across racial lines, and friendship between islanders and mainlanders. Our cultural life, in the broadest sense of the term, 
is getting more indistinguishable from that of the mainland. English is now our usual home language. Add to all this 80 years of indoctrination in American values and primary loyalty not to Hawaii but to the United States. For the Japanese in particular, American nationality is something which they have bought with their blood as well as with their sweat. Because of racial prejudice here as well as on the mainland, Hawaii was relegated to territorial status long after a white population would have been allowed statehood. Territorial status was a great advance over the unabashed racial oligarchy of the Republic, with its disfranchisement of Orientals. Older citizens like myself remember vividly the threatened loss of even this limited self-government during the Massey case 1932 and the nearly complete loss of self-government under Army Rule 1941-44. Statehood has unquestionably brought a greater sense of political security. It has brought also a sense of increased participation and even influence in national political life. Economic Colony Hawaii certainly has substantial remnants of economic colonialism. Most islanders probably are worried over our great dependence upon so economically fragile an industry as tourism, with its low wages and outside ownership. It does not follow, however, that many islanders see themselves as economically oppressed colonials. In the past 45 years, real income, the standard of living, and personal expectations have increased markedly. Participation in the cultural amenities has greatly expanded. From a per capita income above those of only two states, Hawaii has reached the middle ranks nationally. The career open to talent, regardless of race, has greatly expanded. From being practically without unions in 1935, Hawaii has become one of the most heavily unionized states. In short, Hawaii has visibly progressed, not retrogressed, as part of the United States, and few of its residents see anything for them in island nationalism. Native nationalism, on the other hand, has a real foundation in history, including organization in a nation-state, nominally sovereign and headed by a native puppet monarch. For many native Hawaiians, there is an emotional motive for nationalism in resentment of the failure of many of their number to make the great and island society as other ethnic groups which started out with fewer surface advantages have done. However, definition of native nationalism is complicated by point 1. Uncertainty as to who are native Hawaiians. Point 2. Uncertainty as to what sort of role natives are seeking relative to other ethnic groups, and Point 3. Lack of generally acceptable leadership in defining the Hawaiian role. Who are Hawaiians? For some purposes only individuals who can plausibly claim 50% or more native ancestry are Hawaiians. For statistical purposes, anyone with claimed native ancestry however slight is a part Hawaiian, no matter though he identifies culturally and socially with some other group or simply as a local. My own rough guess is that no more than 15% of the population think of themselves as Hawaiians, a rather small minority. This dilution of Hawaiianness and minority status is important in considering native relations with the rest of the island population. Put bluntly, to what extent are other islanders willing to accord native special political standing? To what extent are they willing to accept the assumption that by reason of their nativeness, Hawaiians are specially qualified to speak for all islanders on issues of general concern, such as the bombing of Kaho'olawe and the threat to our ecology from an badly controlled hotel building. I have heard Hawaiians call for sovereignty, but I have not yet heard anyone define what he means by that term. Generally, it is accepted to mean political independence. Do native nationalists who speak of sovereignty mean that Hawaiians should govern the other 80% of the population as well as themselves under the Hawaiian flag? Or that part of the island should be set aside for Hawaiians, who now live intermixed with the general population as a locally self-governing group, somewhat on the lines of an American Indian reservation? Or simply that needy Hawaiians should receive special assistance in adjusting successfully to predominant American patterns? It should be self-evident that anything approaching real native political sovereignty is romantic nonsense, unacceptable to the bulk of the population and probably to the great majority of native Hawaiians. In any event, no effective political capital can be made of native nationalism until Hawaiians themselves have reached some consensus on what they want, until they begin to put their act together. Response to John Rienecke, Hawaii as a Sovereign Nation, by J.D., as read by Schitt's Leopold. A brief multiple-choice test. Which of the following Pacific Islands would have the best chance to survive a nuclear war without devastation? A. Kwajalein B. Guam C. 
Fiji, D, Lanai, E, Oahu, F, Tonga. What does this question have to do with the non-existent Hawaii national question? Everything. After glibly referring to the Hawaii national question as a non-question, John Rienecke wrote a substantial article on a supposedly non-existent issue, making some valuable distinctions along the way. One such valid distinction is that, between what he calls island nationalism and native nationalism, i.e., between a. those of all races who see Hawaii sharply distinguished from mainland USA and b. those who identify themselves as native Hawaiians and see nationhood in strictly ethnic terms. Rienecke is correct in saying these are two distinct but interrelated phenomena. Likewise, his narration of some important historical background stands on solid ground and makes a positive contribution to the issue. The non-existent argument notwithstanding, it is good that his article was written and published. It is from competing ideas that progress in intellectual matters can be made. However, if Rienecke is purporting to represent a Marxist view on the national question as it relates to Hawaii, then such a claim must be challenged and rebutted. I would beg to differ with Rienecke, first on his claim that except for a small minority of native and part native Hawaiians, a sense of island nationalism is almost non-existent. I frankly doubt the truth of that claim, unless it is taken in the most narrow sense to mean people who have consciously come to the conclusion that Hawaii is a nation despite being the 50th state. On the other hand, would the numbers be so few if all island people were given an informed choice of genuine sovereignty in a plebiscite? Such a choice is the last thing the bourgeoisie of Hawaii or the mainland would permit, so the very idea is ridiculed immediately as preposterous or an idle dream, which seems to be Rienecke's view as well. One might note that it is also Margaret Thatcher's view with respect to Northern Ireland, and the Shah's as well as Khomeini's view with respect to the Kurdish people, and the French government's view with respect to Tahiti and other Pacific provinces. How is it that Hawaii is regarded so inevitably linked to the USA while Fiji has become a sovereign nation? Would anyone seriously argue that Tahiti, or Morocco and Algeria earlier, is truly part of France? While it is true that close ties exist between the U.S. and Hawaii culturally, economically and politically, there is nothing inevitable or necessarily desirable about the continuation of such a bond. Colonies and oppressed nations have been known to change their status. Colonial empires disintegrate. That is a historical fact which even the mighty U.S. cannot escape. During the course of such a collapse, those who were forcibly assimilated usually begin to assert themselves and clamor for independence. During the past 100 years, how many such wars of national liberation have been fought precisely to escape imperialist domination? In a few cases, a weakened imperial power has had to concede independence with little struggle, e.g. India from England right after World War II. If one regards integration with a great imperial power as desirable, as apparently Rienecke does, quote, statehood has unquestionably brought a greater sense of political security. Then one is free to express the opinion, but please let not such a view masquerade as leftist, much less Marxist. Such a view is the antithesis of Marxist teachings on the national and colonial question. Over the years, Hawaii has certainly been drawn more closely into the web of U.S. imperialism. It is one thing to state the fact, it is quite another to celebrate it. Without doubt, there has been some economic and political progress in this close association with the U.S., one could say the same thing about the 13 colonies under England. But the time then came when real progress meant a revolutionary break with the past. Imperialism on its deathbed or in the throes of inter-imperialist rivalry will inevitably drag Hawaii down with it if such an association persists. The Right to Self-Determination It is common knowledge among Marxists that nations have the right to self-determination, not within the bourgeois legal system. Of course, but in the sense of a historically justified right arising from the circumstances of having settled and consolidated in a region. One classic example often cited is Ireland in opposition to British imperialism. Countless others could be cited. This elementary Marxist principle cannot be rejected without rejecting Marxism itself. Marx and Lenin wrote at length on the subject. However, the erroneous conclusion, if they are not nations, they have no right to self-determination does not follow. A logical parallel for illustration would be, Hawaiians have the right to fish in the Pacific Ocean. Therefore, if you are not Hawaiian, you do not have the right to fish in the Pacific Ocean. The logic is terrible, yet for many years the left has not seen through what is patently unjustifiable. The question needs close study to extend Marxist principles and avoid promoting dogma. What of groupings that may not have, or been permitted to have, consolidated into nations? 
For example, what about Native American tribes? Not to ignore the idea that some tribes did consolidate into nations, or Aborigines in Australia. Anyone with an ounce of social justice can see that such groups are striving for and have the right to demand self-determination in place of the degrading status of wards or foster children of the dominant imperial power. So while Marxists have, in recent years, spoken at great length about the rights of nations to self-determination and what constitutes a nation, Little attention has been paid to the legitimate claims of non-nation or pre-nation groups which have much in common with classic national liberation struggles. The question is not so much whether Hawaii can currently be called a nation, as whether its future can best be secured as a military outpost for U.S. imperialism or as an independent nation. There are many members of the United Nations smaller than Hawaii. As a sovereign nation, Hawaii probably would have a difficult time economically at first, just as most nations do when they sever the umbilical cord. But with the abundance of resources here and a self-developed trade capability, Hawaii would be in a far better position to secure that independence than most other nations that start out from grinding poverty and a mass of illiterate starving peasants. Far from feeling nationally secure, the official justification for the military presence, and how many dozen bases do we need to feel secure? We should heave a gigantic sigh of relief if they were all to leave precisely because such a fact would remove the almost inevitable need for a Soviet attack on Hawaii should war reach a nuclear stage. Far, far more not less, Mr. Rianeki needs to be said about the Hawaii national question, for it is a question, even if none of us yet has the answer. J.D. First published, Modern Times, Volume 1 through 8, 1977 to 1981. Transcription, editing and markup by Paul Saba. Copyright, this work is in the public domain under the Creative Commons Common Deed. You can freely copy, distribute and display this work, as well as make derivative and commercial works. All credit to the Encyclopedia of Anti-Revisionism online at marxist.org slash history slash erol slash ncm1a slash index.htm hashtag hus. Footnote biographies from Center for Labor Education and Research University of Hawaii West Oahu at hawaii.edu slash uhwo slash clear slash home slash labor dash bios dot html. Transition music by Kiruz, Q-R-E-U-S at kiruz.bandcamp.com slash album slash man dash go dash man. Song Paradise Lost featuring Bliss and Tumi Tunis, produced by Israel.